Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Bro, we got stood up so you and I get stuck just rambling and talking and let waste people's time for an hour. How's that sound? Yeah, I think we'll talk about some interesting things. Maybe we'll talk about some, uh, the state of medicine, the field of medicine, what we've seen in our practices. I got a couple stories for you, man. It's going to blow your mind. Yeah, I think we both have stories. You know, I was just at Low Carb San Diego and that was a lot of fun. We're at the Symposium for Metabolic Health now. We're kind of changing that up. Uh, you know, great time seeing everyone, you know, catching up with people I haven't talked to in a while. Just really, fan we have a lot of fantastic people that, you know, we, we really have to get on this podcast, you know, Tony Hampton being one of them, he's doing a lot of great work in Chicago and, you know, it's just, there's just person after person who's doing really great work and we're just learning a lot from each other. So it's fun. Yeah, man. Um, I, I, I was so jealous, you know, uh, it's tough getting out to the West coast, you know, uh, I even had, you know, I was looking forward to coming, um, but it's just tough. Three kids, man. I'm so jealous of you guys out there. Everybody was there. Um, you know, it, it looked awesome. You know, Rob Sivis' lecture was awesome. I know Dave Diamond, uh, Dave Feldman had some interesting news that came out and sparked a little bit of controversy. Nina Teicholz, um, Gary Talbs, Gary Talbs, history yeah. of medicine saying what we're doing is what they used to do back in the old days. So we're old school. We're not cutting edge anymore. You know, all those kind of things. And when you start learning from, you know, from oncologists and, you know, it, it, the, the scope and, and the the range of, of how important it is to get metabolic health right. You know, even talking about dying of diseases that we worry about, you know, all those things, are, the importance of metabolic health and GI health and mental health and getting enough sleep and exercise. And it was, I mean, get this, man, I got to sit down. We had Finney, <laughs> Dr. Finney's there. We have Mark Kukazella, long distance runner, and Ben Bacchicchio, and we're talking about, okay, what's the best way to exercise? Well, how do we get the most bang for our buck, right? And yeah. different people have different, and so it was a lot of fun getting to the science and, you know, recovery phase and stuff we don't think about uh, generally. So it was just fun to, to, you know, spend time with people and, and just kind of, you know, talk about yeah. life and, and slow down a little bit. You know, uh, uh, yeah, it's in your home turf. I think that's the, the other thing is like... Um, it's nice to be able to connect with people, you know, it's nice to be able to see that we're not the only ones in private practice, you know, you just kind of, I mean, you know, you used to be in a practice of five people. Now it's, you know, you and you have an NP, right? And a couple of medical assistants, right? But it's just, you're the only doctor, right? Yeah, so it's, it's, it, it's fun. It's fun and it's challenging, but man, I remember Tro, you know, I just, I, I just remember just reminiscing a little bit. We were in uh, Boca, and I remember you were going on a cruise after it. I'm like, how in the heck do you take time off for a conference and then go on a cruise? You're like, well, my patients, I just notify them before. And I'm like, that's crazy. And I did that. So I came back to no stress. It's it's unbelievable. Like coming back to your practice when you have a lot fewer patients and you're, you're it and they know they can get in when they want to. And so it's been a lot of, I mean, what a great transition it has been direct primary care. You know, I might have taken a little bit of a pay cut, but. I don't need a lot of money. I, I need a little bit more time, you know? So we, I think as we get older, we start realizing, you know, what matters. But again, you know, I have to thank you for that to say, Hey, look, try this direct. I mean, man, look at medicine now. I, and, and that's the other thing I'll bring up Tro and is talking to doctors at the conference, the amount of burnout in the standard care is unbelievable. Like people are telling me stories about, you know, doctors killing themselves, jumping off a bridge, just quitting, walking away. They all work for dad's business now. And, the amount of doctors walking away after having $500,000 in debt and loans and, you know, all the years of work, they say, forget it, it's not worth it anymore. I ran to the direct primary care people and they're like, I love it. I can't wait to get to work on Tuesday or whatever, you know? So it, it's really a, it's really tells you something that, that doctors have become hostage to a system and, and they're, they're not helping patients and they see it. So these docs that were at the conference, you know, and they're happy because they're helping people with metabolic health, but they're seeing their friends just totally get decimated. Yeah. I, let me tell you, I, I cannot tell you it's a, it's, it's a problem right now. And I just wrote this. I, I'm, I read, I wrote a like five-year summary of kind of where I was five years ago. You know, remember those 
it's been four years, Brian, we've been talking about this. Like It was right exactly four years ago when we first started talking about this podcast, right? And we were calling yeah. ourselves Keto Quacks. It's been four years. It's five years I've really been in private practice, right? And um, I'm coming into that, uh, that, you know, that time frame, and I'm reflecting on and and on who I am and the person I've become. And I have to tell you, just morally and ethically, I have to thank you. There's been times where I've been challenged and you've really helped me, you know, just morally and ethically. And I just want to tell you, I'll never forget those things. But if you look at the landscape where physicians were, right, when I started, it was 75% were private. In 2015, 75% of physicians were in private practice. And at that time, hospitals were buying up practices. Now, fast forward seven or eight years later, it's the exact opposite. 75% of physicians are employed by a hospital, venture capital, or insurance company, right? And if you look consecutively, the uh, hospital pay has gone up, insurance pay, uh, doctor pay has come down, right? And the quality of life for every doctor has gone down. and um, and the physician apathy is at an all time high. And the stories we hear from people, the stories we hear from people are, are reflecting that. Like I literally had a patient, a patient conversation yesterday where she was crying on the phone. She's a new patient. She's like, I don't know where to turn to, right? She's like, nobody will listen to me. Nobody will listen to me. And it's not like she doesn't have doctors, she has three doctors, right? But she has symptoms, nobody can figure it out, nobody wants to figure it out, and she's facing seven minute visits, right? And their doctor, they're burnt out, I don't blame them, they're burnt out, COVID pandemic, this and that, right? You know, um, it's a terrible system. And, and what's happening, it's like a, you know, you, you kind of have to step back, people don't realize, you know, that it's, insurance companies to some degree, hospital systems to some degree, the reimbursement rates to some degree, what doctors all they know to some degree, right? And literally this patient was was like, please help me. Yeah, and that's the problem is, you know, when, when you have 500,000, you know, three, I don't even know what doctors coming out now. I know what mine were, but you have that much of loans. You think you're going to say anything controversial at all or, or question the system? You can't because you will be gone. So a lot of these doctors would come to me and go, hey, thanks for what you and Troy are saying. I can't say it publicly because I'll get fired, but thank you. It's the truth. And it's like, well, crud, that's terrible. Like when you can't, when you go to medicine to help your patient, I think so many doctors are saying, okay, if I help my patient, I get fired. <laughs> It's, it's a crazy system because you have seven minutes. If you spend 20 minutes talking to someone about lifestyle, which is to us is nothing, uh, you're going to get fired. They're going to say, look, you're not seeing enough patients. You got to see 35 patients a day. If you're seeing 10, you're not, gonna, you're not cutting it for us or you're gone. So, so a lot of these doctors are just a cog in the wheel. It's, it's tragic. you know. I, it's tragic because if you think for yourself, you wait a minute, I can really help these people. That we really have to make some changes. I think there's changes coming. And enough doctors are talking behind the scenes saying, we got it. We got to fix the system. We cannot have this system where people are getting more and more sick. I mean, some of the poster presentations throw of where one of them was, you know, reversing foot ulcers on a poorly controlled diabetic by getting the sugars under control. And you see how fast these kit, these people recover and prevent an amputation, you know, these kind of things that, you know, how important sugar control is and how important understanding addiction is in this whole process. Because if your sugars are 300 and you're craving chocolate all the time, there's something wrong. <laughs> your sugar does not have to be bumped up with, with sugars of 300 and, and the amount of devastation it causes is, is unreal. You know, I think, um, just to add on to that, you know, the uh, just to go more into that system, you know, it's the patients who are suffering. You know, some of these posters that you see, all these people who are going to these metabolic health conferences, they're inspired. They're inspired, just like Dr. David Unwin was inspired when he started to see his patients get better. And look at the great work he's done. Look at the work you're doing. Mark Cucuzella is doing. Eric Westman is doing. Rob Sivers is doing, right? All these people all throughout, you know, the United States. Um you know, who are making a difference. But, you know, I think what's happening in medicine right now is these small town doctors, they're getting converted into these just conveyor belts, right? I called the local doctor to get a, get the colonoscopy results, right? And just talk with him about the patient. 
and it went to an overseas call center. You know, it was literally an overseas call center that I was like, well, what if uh, last week I called? Well, we got bought by venture capital and we have a overseas call center now. Right. So, I mean, it's just things that you would never expect to happen in medicine are happening and care is suffering, you know, um, and a lot of times patients aren't even seeing their doctors. You know, they're seeing like an NP or they're, or hospitals now are rotating doctors in different clinics just to kind of, you know, just to make it not about that doctor patient relationship, but more about the clinic, right? And not about, you know, the, the thing that we know, that sacred bond that we know is like so critical. Um, anyway, it's been a, it's been challenging. I wanted to give you, I wanted to tell you the story of the, the doctor that I called very recently. Um, but, but I don't know. I mean, tell me, so, so this conference was inspiring basically pretty much. Yeah. You know, and I gotta, I gotta talk about some, you know, cause the, we hit controversial topics. I think when, now that I look back, I mean, really this podcast ages well. You go back and look at stuff we were talking about three years ago, four years ago. There's nothing that we said that I would say, yeah, I want to step that back. And, you know, maybe some things changed, but for the most part, I think when you say, okay, this is what we're seeing, explain to me why it's happening. What's great now, Tro, is a lot of the research is coming out saying, yep, this is what's happening. This is what we're seeing. And it's like, wow, you know, like what Chris Palmer is doing with mental illness. It's a huge, huge issue. And right now it's even worse. And so when you start saying, gosh, some of the stuff we were seeing gets validated now as far as the cravings and the sugar cravings and all these kind of things and the addiction model and how even Joan Iflinger gave a great, she was giving a great example of showing how addictive fat can be. So a lot of people are on the low carb diet, then they're eating a ton of fat. They're just substituting the, the other stuff with high fat, high, you know, high, uh, uh, very um, satisfying foods that are that that they crave like crazy. So the, these addiction models, these things we have to really focus on. So sometimes, and I was presenting cases, like one case, put her on a really high fat ketogenic diet, totally normalize her sugars in a day or two, right? And then we say, okay, let's taper down the fat and see how you do with time because she's really insulin resistant. I have another guy who fasted for two days and all of a sudden his sugar's normalized. So you kind of say, because of everyone we know, Jason Fung, does he have a contribution? Of course he does. And, and does, does, does going high protein for some people work? Yes. Does going high fat for some people? Yes. So our job is to look at all the different variables and, and, and try to figure out, as a matter of fact, Tro, one of my patients I presented, 72-year-old lady comes to me and it's kind of, you know, that, that feeling when you look and you go, oh, the damage is done already, like peripheral neuropathy, gastroparesis from poorly controlled diabetes, uh, uh, panic attacks, anxiety, all this stuff. So, you know, she can't eat. She throws up every time she eats. She's lost 30 pounds. She weighs 100 pounds, maybe 96 pounds. And the family goes, we don't know what to do with her. Like, we're miserable. We don't know what to do. And so I look at her med list. She's on glipizide and she's on Xanax and some other stuff, hypertensive medicines. So I was like, huh, let's get a CGM and just look and see. Guess what the next day I see? Hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia. No one talked to her about diet. She's 72 years old. And so I said, well, guys, let's try, let's get rid of glipizide and let's try, you know, making some changes. This lady, her, her sugars have totally normalized because she wasn't having panic attacks. She was having hypoglycemia and they think, oh, she's having panic attacks. We have to keep giving her more Xanax and it's not working. Let's give her more and more until it works. And it's like, well, no one checked her sugar because they're checking their sugars twice a day. So, you know, and I was, I was interested because, you know, um, Neville Wellington from South Africa was there talking and they don't even do finger sticks. They're arguing to get finger sticks over there. And, and I was thinking, man, we have so many. I mean, we, a CGM is a no brainer for us here, but over there, they're thinking, you know, you don't use look at the three month sugar average. That's all you need. But this lady, her three month sugar average was high because she had these big, huge spikes and these big, huge dips. So everything, you know, it looks like she was hyper. So they're putting on more and more the lower sugars and she's getting <laughs> lower sugar. So the CGM in one day told us how to manage this patient. Right. And so, you know, those kind of tools we have is just amazing. And you're the king of monitoring of, you know, having the, the blood pressure cuff and scale and, and, and CGM and all that stuff. And that's, you know, one thing you taught oh, me. We've it's taken a step further, man. Uh, sleep studies, Holter monitors. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, temperature, pulse ox. Uh, you know, I just, it, it's all comes from how do we make this easier for patients? Go back. Remember the HMO days, right? Remember the insurance days? It was all, you know, we try to get people to come in for this visit. It, the entire medical field is visit driven. 
right? Because doctors are paid by the amount of times you see them, right? So it was, you know, the, if you look at the standard doctor, and I remember thinking this five years ago, why am I bringing somebody back for a blood pressure check when I can just monitor it remotely? Why would I need to, why wouldn't I want that information from their scale, right? But this comes from the thought process of how do we do better? How do we make it easier for us and the patients? How do we become better at what we do? How do we make it more convenient for the patients? How do we make it more convenient and thorough for us? We have more information now that we can pull in from. And I think one of the big things that's lost in medicine is how do we innovate and do better? Not do the same things that we were taught, how we were taught them. You know, how do we do better? And this has been one of the things that, that has been like the hallmark of what I do. It's like, I'm just trying to do better than I did last year. I'm trying to be a better person than I was last year. I'm trying to be a better doctor than I was last year. I'm trying to be a better podcast co-host than I was last year. Um, the bottom line is, you know, um, this, a lot of what we do in medicine, it's based upon this insurance model that says, bring a patient back. But you know, like that CGM, you gave it, you analyzed it, you got all this, you know, all these results, all this information, and you didn't even have to have them see you. You know, yeah, I mean, and we get yeah. and we could do Zoom meetings from wherever if they want, right? Whatever works for the patient works for me. I'm I'm here anyway, so you might as well come see me here. I'm paying overhead. I'm paying for the lights, so I love the the patient contact. But I but I've also learned, you know, there's Verta who's doing great, and I I have experience doing just remote with some people that you know we're just getting them on a program, not as a primary care, of course, because you have to do your physical exams and all that stuff. So. It's amazing to me. I, I still kind of pinch myself a little bit because I have a lot of patients who are they're they're using me for primary care, but they're, they're going to a big one of these big mills and they go, I go in there. No one calls me back like they don't get a call back from their doctor for days, like four days later. They're calling him back when they're sick. It's like, well, heck, you'll be either be dead or better by then. It's ridiculous. But the, it's the overwhelmed system. That's the problem is that you know, the doctors are overwhelmed. They're not going to go home and read about your new condition. Like now I have time to say, oh, you have this weird kind of, you know, I have a guy with a uh, glycogen storage disease type 10, and there's only 15 cases in the world described. And he was totally mismanaged. We changed him and this guy got his life back and he's working out again. He's exercising. He figured out how to get fat adapted and he's crushing it. And you go, gosh, dang it. How long would this guy have? He was already pre-diabetic and had triglycerides of 650 and all this stuff under what they're the experts were saying. So sometimes you start saying, well, let's try something different. And I think that's the thing with medicine is now we have these, I don't know if you heard, but AB 2098 just passed in California. So I'm counting my days. What, because, is, what, is, what is that? Help me understand because I don't know anything about uh, California politics. Yeah, neither do I, man. I don't get it this, but basically what they're saying is anyone who questions the truth Anyone who questions it, they can. The medical board can come and take your license. Now, the medical board is not elected; they're they're appointed by the governor. So, if you start saying stuff that they don't like, if you're talking low carb and they don't like it, they can come say, "Ah, you're giving misinformation. We're going to take your medical license." And so, if you're say the establishment is now carnivore, now if you're vegan, are they going to come take your medical license because you're saying vegan stuff and they don't agree? Like who? who as we've learned <laughs> dramatically over the last two years, is truth changes based on new information, right? So some things they said, you know, whatever. If you go back and say, if you're vaccinated, there's a, you'll never get it. You don't have to worry. Well, we know that's not true. So now do you go take their medical license because they were wrong, right? Because there's stuff we've seen when, we, when we're seeing it in clinical practice. So things we're seeing. So for the reason I'm concerned is back three years ago when we were talking about mood getting better with low-carb diet, we, we saw it happening, but we didn't have all the data. So people can say, well, if you say, and we got threatened on that too. They said, you should have your medical license revoked, right? For even suggesting that, but the data has clearly stated that's what's happening. So that's what happens is people have to understand the truth changes and, and expressing your opinion, say, I'm not sure of this. Let's wait. Let's make sure everything's okay with this new drug that just came out. Maybe that's not the standard of care. Maybe it won't be the standard of care. So our job is to say we're advocates for our patients, what's working. So for instance, they can say, well, we don't believe in continue that we don't, there's not enough data on continuous glucose monitors to use this and you're outside the standard of care. So we're going to come take your medical license, like stuff like that. And there's a, there's, I know a lot of doctors that I talk to who are getting board certified in multiple states because of that, because if they come and say, now you can't practice medicine, that's your, that's, you know, I mean, could you imagine like, they just say you can't practice. Now you have to pay your school loans and you got debt and you got all these other issues and then you're going to fight it and you'll probably win, but you're going to fight it for four years. 
Yeah, so I'm just seeing it now. This is a, a misinformation bill. So that's a that's a problem, you know, because massive, early, massive problem. You know, this is a this is a problem because, you know, when when I contacted I contacted New York State Board, I said, hey, look, I noticed that the you know the state medical society is saying uh, doctors who post misinformation, you know, should be very cautious. They can get their license revoked. So I I asked them. I said. You know, I, this is preemptive. I'd like to be proactive in my social media posting. Can you tell me what misinformation is? And they said, we can't give you that information. I'm like, yeah, exactly. Can't give me exactly. That That's that, I had the same exact thing happen with my medical board. I said, hey, a lot of people are asking for this medicine. What should I do? What's your stance? What do you do? And, and so I, I did it in writing twice with no response. So then I called them and they go, well, you have to do it in writing, not verbally. And I go, well, I didn't write in twice, but you're not responding to me. How many doctors are there in California that are asking this question? So, and they basically said, proceed as you, you do. And then we'll determine later. Like, it's like saying, is there a speed limit or not? <laughs> they go, we don't know if there's speed limit or not. But yeah. you might get three thousand dollars in fines down the road because we we say there is a speed limit. So it, that's the issue is like saying, write well, out what the truth is. Then so I could like. That, can we talk about that even more? Because you know, very you know, we we looked at work from Dr. John Mandrola, a cardiologist who's previously editor at Medscape, and we looked at uh, Tracy Beth Hogue, who's a MPH and a staunch uh, um, you know advocate for you know, uh, informed consent, medical liberty, they put out two different publications where they analyzed some of the adverse events uh, from this most recent vaccination. And they came up with an adverse event rate, which is pretty consistent with the flu shot, which is about one in 2000 to one in 6,000, particularly in our young, you know, men. And when they first came out with their respective studies, you know, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the current administration, you know, the Walensky and all of their surrounding proponents, people who generally side with, you know, uh, Fauci and Walensky with regards to their policy, they all base all the proponents, not those people themselves, but the people around them that generally support them and work with them. They were very critical of this work. They said it's pretty much to say that there's myocarditis at a rate of one to 2,000 to one to 6,000 is, is misinformation. They're they're toxic, they're going to cause vaccinophobia. Um, and they were basically called misinformation just even months ago, six months ago. And then literally, you know, Israel's data came out, which showed that that was true. Canadian data came out that showed that that was true. And finally, UK data, the New UK Zealand data, data yeah, exactly. Australia data. So all the data came out basically saying, wait a second, these people were actually exactly right. And so what was previously said, this is, you know, they're fear mongering, they're causing, they're going to cause vaccine hesitancy. These were all the things. How could they publish these things? They're biased. You know, that was the narrative, you know, and what's sad is, um, you know, it really, uh, they, what they found was they're actually right. You know, there's, hey, there's this mild amount of adverse events and, you know, it is what it is. Like, that's the way the cookie crumbled. So we didn't need to be so, you know, aggressive. I I, I don't think, but, you know, you tell me. Yeah, well, it's hard because there's an agenda now, and I now get it. Now they're the science, you know, now they're- Well, the it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing because, you, you know, I and, and I've said this a, a fair amount of times and I don't know who I stole it from, but but it's it's not the problem of being wrong. It's, 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 the problem is being right too early. Like a lot of people were right too early. They said, here's what I'm seeing in clinic. This is what I'm concerned about. They raised issues. And then they say, well, you can't talk about that. Well, but it's what I'm seeing. If there was a new, if you just think about it as a new drug, Tro, if there was a new drug that came out and all of a sudden you start seeing adverse events and you start saying anything about it, then they say, well, you can't talk about that drug. You, you never hear that with a drug. No one's ever said, no, you can't talk bad about the adverse effects of a, well, this we new should, we should talk blood about pressure that medicine. Because there's a weight loss drug that is very, you know, that I actually, I actually like the medication, but apparently in JAM Internal Medicine, it was just published. I don't know if you saw this, you know, this is kind of breaking information. Uh, there actually, there was a death reported and a couple of serious outcomes. So the class of medications is the GLP-1 drug, mm -hmm. right? The, you know, you've probably heard of them. You probably have heard of them, maybe use them. Ozempic, you know, goes by trizepatide, semaglutide, Wagovi, Ozempic, Sixenda. You know, in JAMA internal medicine, they, the FDA did an analysis. And what do they find? There was two deaths 
that occurred with the use of these medication. One was from a severe gallbladder infection. One was from liver necrosis. Um, we know that this information aggravates that hepatobiliary system. You know, we know it can cause pancreatitis in some people. It's very rare, right? Um, but what they found was is a lot more likely, and, and there's a lot more reports than we previously knew. And so, you know, we went to the airwaves and said, hey, you know, guys, just be aware of this. It doesn't mean the medication doesn't work. It just means we have to be able to talk about these things in an open and honest way. And we need to be able to consider these. And patients should know that, hey, look, there's risk. And they should have the choice of what to do. You know, um, so that was published in the JAMA Internal Medicine. Uh, and I'm not trying to fear monger against this drug. We have a lot of people in our practice who use this amazing diabetes drug. It's a great drug. We have people who use it for weight loss. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, it's without, you know, nothing has no side effects. Everything has got a side effect. So yeah, and that's our job. That's our job to look and go, okay, here's what I'm seeing. Because if it helps 10,000 patients and it harms one or two, then we say, look, my job is to do informed consent and go, look, here's the risk and here's the benefit. But if I can't tell people, there's a potential risk because it might cause hesitancy. Well, I'm not, I, I, I'm not doing my job. I'm, I'm liable in that. That's malpractice. It's malpractice not to discuss the risk and benefits of any treatment I give. So I have an antibiotic. If you say, look, you have a really bad lung infection. There's a 1% chance you could die from the antibiotic. There's a 95% chance you die from the infection. Then we treat the infection and say, look, here, 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 there is a risk. Here's what can happen. Look at chemotherapy. I mean, gosh, there, you know, you look at all the side effects and problems, but you go, look, you got terminal cancer. Like, do you want to give it a shot? So, but looking at the risks and benefits of everything we do, and that's, that's the one thing that's really fallen out of, you know, patient autonomy for a patient to be able to say, yeah, I understand I could die from this. And, and I think there's, it's more of an issue. Like we've had patients, Tro, and, you know, I respect religious beliefs. And so I have someone who's Jehovah's Witness and, you know, I know I can't give you a blood transfusion. Right. But I can't force it and say, you're going to die if you don't get a blood transfusion. I go, look, <laughs> this is a really risky surgery. If you don't get blood transfusion, is there another thing we could do? But you can't just say, no, I don't think you're strong enough in your faith. I'm going to give you a blood transfusion anyways, because I don't think you really go to church as much as you say you do. Right. I mean, we, we have so many value judgments. Our, our part of our job is to respect the autonomy of the patient who says, look, I just don't want certain treatments. I've looked at the risk. I've looked at the benefits myself. I understand clearly that I could die if I don't get a blood transfusion. My religion tells me I can't do it. Right. Yeah. I, I, so that's the thing. Like, let's tie this back to nutrition. I think the problem, a lot of times people are like, hey, Tro, hey, Brian, you guys are so interested in nutrition. You're so interested in weight loss. You know, you're so interested in metabolic health. How does this all tie in? And, you know, I think it comes from you know, like, Brian, you've been practicing what, 15, 20 years now, 20 years, 20 years, man, you are, you are really old. I've seen it all, man. <laughs> you're really old. So look, 20 years, You've been practicing and you've seen the same themes happen again and again, right? What happened with nutrition policy, right? We kind of see that policies, you know, come into other things. And, it, you know, it doesn't, you know, I think bottom line is, is we see that, you know, we have to be very careful in, you know, as our role as doctors. Yeah, there, there's, we have to be very careful with what we recommend and it has to be grounded in evidence. But at the same time, you know, we have to question the narrative because sometimes the narrative isn't exactly in line with what the individual needs, what a population may benefit from and what a general recommendation may benefit from, you know, may not be what's right for the person in front of us. Just an example, there was a study just this month or, you know, within the past two months that came out, you know, generally when it comes to my kids, I tell them to eat fruit. You know, you got to go ahead. You guys can have fruit, berries, apples. They're eating peaches now, right? So they eat some fruit every now and then. Not a lot, but they eat it. They have it as a late night snack if that's what they're looking for, right? They have fruit, right? Now, uh, you know, avocado, olives, you know, coconut, all of these, right? There was a study in people with liver disease that literally did fruit restriction. All it did was have, you know, Less have unlimited fruit, right? Was the recommendation versus, hey, you should probably lower your carbs and you should lower your fruit. And what do they find? They found that those people with liver disease did better when they restricted their fruit. So again, this comes back to the general message. So a lot of times people hear us talk about COVID and they're like, wow, they're really out there. But no, apply it to nutrition. 
you have this general recommendation and you know the AHA, Harvard, all these people, they say, hey, have more fruit. It's not necessarily wrong. My kids have more fruit. But when you have liver disease and you're in my office and you have metabolic syndrome, I'm not sure that that's exactly the right message for you. Maybe it's right to say have more fruit than you know, ice cream and, and French fries. Maybe that's right. Maybe not. Okay. Probably is right. But hey, why don't you go low carb and even limit fruit? That's not a wrong message for somebody with diabetes. Not don't eliminate fruit, but maybe have low sugar fruits, you know, like a strawberry or a raspberry or a blackberry or a coconut or an olive or an avocado or cucumbers, right? So bottom line, I think the problem is, is the people who come in and say, oh, this population-based data, everybody should be doing it. That's the evidence. No, the person in front of you Right. When you're a doctor, that's what matters. Do you yeah, agree? That, that, ex exactly right. And that's how we should have handled a lot of this stuff from the beginning too. We go, okay, let me sit this patient in front of me and look at your risk and your benefit from everything we do. And that patient, like our job is to say, what's going to kill you? What's the most likely thing to kill you in the next five years? Right. And avoid those things. So if your sugar's 300, I would say, yeah, get rid of fruit, cut your carbs. We got to get that insulin down from 58. Let's see what we can do. Can you have more fruit and carbs down the road? Yes, you probably can. Most people can. So you look and you go, okay, let's see. Maybe you need a higher fat diet to get your sugars under control for a little while, for a little while. And then we taper that down. Or maybe we say, hey, you're super fit. You're an athlete. Let's liberalize your carbs. All the time I'm telling people, you need to have more carbs. Your LDL is going crazy. We don't know the answer yet. So liberalize your carbs. And you know, one of the ladies I presented at, at, at in San Diego, her on Thursday, her LDL was 243. And she was worried about it. And I go, yeah, you know, we, we don't know that. We don't know long-term yet. You know, uh, what, what does that mean? Her triglycerides, HDL, everything else is perfect. A1C, everything's perfect. And she weighs 100 pounds. So I go, let's liberalize your carbs over the weekend and recheck your numbers on Monday and see if that. So she dropped her LDL 60 points in three days, right? A friend of mine, I go, hey, how much did you drop? Over the weekend, he dropped his LDL 80 points. So yes, dietary does, you can fast for three days and it'll make your LDL go through the roof. Does that mean you're sicker when you're fasting? Well, the data doesn't show that, but your LDL will go up during that time, you know? So it's really kind of figuring out for each individual what works. And that's what we do, Tro, is, is personalized medicine. We can't just say, well, no one could ever eat fruit or everyone has to eat fruit every day or they can't be healthy, right? We, we know, that we, we kind of see those things and we understand, I think the big thing that's come out over the last two years is the importance of metabolic health. You know, I just sat down with the, the head of an ICU here that I used to work at and we, we, she told me case after case after case. And she said, we knew what we were seeing. It was all the metabolically sick. That's why she's at a low carb conference now. And she's the head of an ICU because she saw who was dying and people who were in the hospital saw who was dying. So they were just saying, this is what I'm seeing. And then they would get mocked on, you know, they, you're, you're fat shaming or you're, you're picking on people, but they're like, no, this is what I'm seeing. It's not a judgment. It's what it is. <laughs> just what it is. So, you know, and it does go back to metabolic health, gut health, and gut mental health, stress, sleep, all these things, alcohol use, all these things play a role in our chance of, of you know, surviving the next pandemic or, or whatever comes our way. Well, I think like, the, you know, it's really important to kind of highlight what you just said. You brought up another example of the standard meshes may not be in line with what somebody, what's happening to somebody. So you have somebody, they lost weight with low carb, their blood sugars are under control and, you know, their HDL improves, their LD, you know, their triglycerides improve, their A1C improve, their weight is down. They have a great relationship with food. Now, the question becomes is, hey, look, their LDL went up. Does LDL matter? Yeah, everything matters. Fever matters, you know, blood counts matter. Everything matters. But does it matter in relation to the other improvements she experienced? right? Probably not. And that's your job as a doctor to figure out, does this matter now? Can we modify this in a way that preserves your overall health, all your goals, right? And you said, hey, look, just liberalize your carbs just a bit, right? And you may get the best of both worlds. That's what a good doctor does. But they're armed with information, right? We took Dave Feldman's work and we put it into the literature. So now doctors can sink their teeth into something. Hey, look, this works. You know, it's there. It's published. Right. And and that's the that's the idea here is like, can we take this from being the things we do anecdotally? And that's what's beautiful about the SMHP. And can we make it into you know protocols? And can we make can we expand upon it? Can we make it easy for doctors 
to improve. And the standard message is LDL is bad. So you see this patient, right? They have a high LDL. Well, everything's bad. It's bad. But if you take a step back and look at the whole picture, it sounds like her cardiac risk may have decreased over time, right? And now she's just left with one risk factor instead of many. And now, well, you're like, well, I can even address that risk factor, right? And, and you did, right? So, so the, the current mantra is LDL is bad, so nobody should do keto. And that's a problem. Because yeah, and then also throw under, under, you know? understanding too that the other problem that happens is we've all seen it too. A diabetic comes in, their their uh, their uh, triglycerides are six hundred fifty. Their LDL is falsely lower because of this energy model, and you see, oh my gosh! Until we fix the triglycerides, we don't know what your LDL is honestly. So I've had people that all of a sudden their LDL goes crazy high when you fix the triglycerides in the HDL, but the HDL is tripled by then. LDL comes up a little bit, but you know, it's one of those things where you start realizing we can falsely reassure people to go, your LDL is fine. Don't worry about it. But yeah, I see it all the time. Patients come to me and they go, your cholesterol is perfect. And their LDL is 96, but their triglycerides are 480. <laughs> and they go, that's perfect. And your triglycerides are 20. We know these risk factors and, you know, you know, Ken Berry just did a good uh, review of some of the stuff saying, what are your big risk factors for having a heart attack? And you look and the LDL was such a small LDL, small LDL, not LDL, but the small LDL was a little piece of the pie, but metabolic disease, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, not lack of exercise, all these things were a huge, huge 98% of the pie of your risk factor. So it's one of those things you say, okay, what can we modify in these risk factors? Can we get more sleep? Can we watch our stress? All these other things we talk about that somehow we forget about it. By the way, Tro, part of my talk was showing the scientific evidence that stress affects cortisol levels, insulin levels, insulin sensitivity, and all that stuff. So there's zero doubt in my mind what I was seeing clinically is true. It's scientifically proven that stress affects metabolic health. Yeah, and guess what we've been doing for the last two and a half years, being yeah, under major stress. Out. You know, if you look at the people who died, they, you know, the most common cause of death outside of obesity was anxiety and and you know, uh, stress-related disorders, right? So the thing is, is that um, this is this is the problem, right? You have this general guidance, right? With with the you know situation with the COVID, how we started this discussion with nutrition, right? With even with medications, right? With nutrition, everybody should eat carbs and more fruit and more whole grains. Well, wait a second, that's not true, right? Everybody should take, with diabetes should take Ozempic. Well, wait a second, that's not exactly true. You can get pancreatic inflammation and you can get, uh, you know, liver injury in one case and death. And so, you know, and look at this, look at this, look at this situation now, LDL is terrible, right? LDL is bad. Anything that causes higher LDL, you know, we should stop that right away. Well, that's not exactly true. These patients that you had, you know, they had this individual improvement and, and, you know, you can do things to address it outside of the current mantra. And I think it all comes back down to respecting the person in front of you and working with them, you know, and spending time. I'm sure most doctors, if they knew, hey, if you see an LDL increase on a low carbohydrate diet, you know, don't freak out, just, you know, do a little bit of digging make sure it's not a genetic issue, get their prior labs, make sure it was normal before. And if it was, consider adding back some carbs, consider, you know, adding back some fiber with their meals, right? These small little things, but we need time. We need physicians to have time to learn about this so that they can not just blindly accept whatever is told LDL is bad, that message. And we need to generate that data so they can actually have something to uh, change with. Um, and it sounds like the SMHP and that conference was was just, you know, the tip of the iceberg of what we're going to need. Yeah, and, and having the data and showing clinical outcomes and patient outcomes, and it's it's amazing. It's amazing what we're seeing. And uh, uh, it's funny because a lot of people are saying what we, we said, they, they feel like a snake oil salesman when they say, well, you know, I'm having a lot of anxiety right now. Well, low carb can help that. Oh, I, my knee hurts. Oh, low carb can help that. All right. And they, they're, they're, that's their tool for everything. But you know, it is kind of interesting how people respond. And and I think what happens is like, I don't even know, I think Fedke came up with this, but you can't unsee what you've seen. So once you see it and you go, oh, right. Wow. This is actually working. Like, 
you know, what Mark Cucuzella has been doing. All these people have been doing great work around the world. And you start saying, wow, they're having really good outcomes or they're all liars. <laughs> they could all be lying, but it's unlikely because there's nothing to gain. You have to always look like if I tell you, say, this is the best vitamin. Oh, by the way, I sell it here. Go to, go to my website and you can buy it here or I'm selling it. Or if I say, hey, just go to your local store and get it. There's a big difference in that messaging, right? So you have to look and see for all of us, what, what what's my best interest if do I care really? I don't, I'm not invested in low carb companies. I'm not invested in, you know, whatever, you know, putting cereal out of business. Say, Hey, here's what my patients are doing. Here's what they're seeing benefits. And having the CGM really continuous glucose monitor really helps people to make decisions for themselves and say, Oh, whenever I eat that one food, like today, one of my guys, he eats scones, half a scone every, every time his sugars go crazy. So now he sees and goes, yeah, that's not a good choice. I'm going to do something a little different. And then he can change it, right? So having that education, then you know. Or stuff can say it's a low-carb cereal, and then their sugar spike every time they eat it, right? Then you say, well, maybe it's not low-carb. Uh, smart sweets, Chalk Zero, consistently in every patient I've seen. I got no stock against them. I have them in my house. You know, I don't really eat them, but they raise blood sugars, you know, consistently. I've seen that again and again. Yeah, and I think picking your poison, you go, hey, every once in a while, it's okay. It's not It's not that if you raise your sugar a little bit, if you're going to go work out for three hours and you raise your sugar a little bit, uh, you know, it's, it's not that big of a deal. But if that little piece of chocolate makes you go crazy and you can't think for two months and you go off the rails, then you have to look at that and go, okay, this isn't good for me. So it's really, again, even, even with rosettes, some people can do it and it works fine and they're great and it's their bridge and they're, they're at a birthday party and go, that's a healthier choice for me. I'll do that. Other people have one and then they want cookies their whole life and they're crazy. So it's it's yeah, really being able to intervene. Harm. It's the less harm approach. And if it's exactly. not harm to do that, then find something that's less harm. You know, it's funny. Um, it's uh, And that's an individual. Nobody can be that judge for you. Like I know personally in my life that if I didn't have a Nutribullet with ice and some chocolate protein, that if I wasn't able to get myself just a little bit of that chocolate flavor every now and then, you know, which I literally have right here that I would probably be out, you know, getting some ice cream. So I have a less harm approach for me. Now, some people, you know, <laughs> that's, that's a setup for them to fail. They taste the chocolate, they get even more sweet cravings. Or, or the other know? thing, throw is some people, if they don't have that every once in a while, it's a setup to fail. So it's figuring out who you are. Some people can moderate and some people have to abstain. Some people are carnivore and they go, I just don't eat anything sweet and I do fine. My brain is right. I feel great. My energy, my mood, everything's great. So am I going to argue with them? No, I'm not going to say, well, you no. have to have yeah, some kind had, of artificial sweet. Yeah, Brett Lloyd on the podcast. Imagine yeah. telling him, well, you need to include, you know, just a little bit of fiber. No, I'm sorry, Brett. You're the man. If you're listening to this, um, you know, his story is so powerful. You know, yeah, his, so his, and anyone who hasn't listened, I've had him on life's best medicine from that perspective and, and low carb MD, listen to his story. I mean, he's a great guy and he, his life dramatically changed. He's like a Paul to Saul, you know, Saul to Paul type thing where it's a dramatic change in his whole outlook on life and all that. You see how happy he is. Like, I'm going to tell him to change what he's doing. Yeah, exactly. Well, you unless I had really good evidence to the contrary, I, there was no way yeah. I would. You know, imagine telling somebody like that you, or somebody whose seizures are resolved that, hey, you really need to go include some more fruit or more, you know, have, you know, uh, whatever. You can have a little bit of Skittles or whatever the message is, right? So the idea is, you know, everybody's individual, you know, and uh, sure, if you feel restricted, you feel deprived, some of these things are going to be value for you. But imagine telling, you know, uh, whoever that you got to have some low carb cereal, you know, it doesn't, it's not always the, again, it comes back to the individual, we cannot get bogged down in these overarching themes and, and pretend there's a ministry of truth. And we have, you know, guidelines that must be followed. Absolutely. No, it's up to the doctor, what the doctor, you know, uh, and your, your advocate, what you agree with them, what you want to do with them, the partnership you guys have and the decisions you guys make together, you know, that's kind of the things to explore. Honestly, it comes down to the person. Nobody can do anything to you without your consent, right? Nobody can do anything to you without your consent. Um, and, so, and, and obviously outcomes are important. So if, obviously if people are having really bad outcomes, it has to be looked at and say, wait, this is dangerous medicine you're doing. But if you're having great outcomes, I don't really think there's a case against you. What are they going to do? Say, well, none of your patients died, so we're going to come against you and for malpractice. So I think it's one of those things where you, you, we have to have caution whenever you question the system and you have to be reasonable. You can't just say, okay, everyone, I don't even want to say that loud, but you know, drink bleach or something crazy. 
you know, and you go, well, obviously that's not a, it was, you know, it was inject bleach. It was inject bleach, inject bleach or whatever, but you know how all those things get twisted and you go, okay, this is crazy. And but well, we've seen stuff. Like, remember, I don't know if you know, Tro, but it was going to be the next big thing was inhaled insulin and everyone's like oh my gosh this is going to revolutionize yeah, the people yeah, and look yeah, at yeah. all the disasters that happened after that oh man it was terrible yeah. it didn't stay long either and they're like oh yeah yeah we're here we're, we're gonna you know all the experts are coming and saying this is the best thing on earth was it no it caused all kinds of immune problems and, and lung problems and, and all it was a disaster so you start realizing okay things may sound good on paper they go oh, that's good and then it, when in practicality that's our job is to report what we're seeing so it's kind of like saying you work for a uh, whatever company, a food company, and you start noticing all your coworkers dying and you go, okay, you can't be a whistleblower. We're going to take your <laughs> job away. At some point you have to be able to say, Hey, this is reasonable. I have it documented. And, and uh, you know, a good doctor is going to document what they're seeing. So, you know, it, it, I just think we've come to a place where we really have to trust the primaries more. And if you look back Tro, and, and, and this is what really with Gary Taub's speech, I was really reflecting on this is, Back then, they had no randomized controlled trial. It was clinical evidence that the doctor said, hey, here's what I'm seeing. Maybe we try this and see what's happening. And then they would all say, yeah, it's working. Let's do that. And everyone's not dying anymore You know, when you wash your hands between patients. Okay, you're not as crazy. We'll, we'll get you out of the insane asylum that, that Semmelweis was locked up in because he questioned the system. And then we, when people questioned doing frontal lobotomies on people, they said, these people are crazy. That's the only treatment. And then they were, they were right. right. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that after the facts, you know, I, I tease some of these great researchers that are doing great work. And I say, you know, probably after about 10 or 15 years after you die, people are going to realize how great you are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's so great. That doesn't sound like a, a lot, but yeah, you know, it, the contributions we make it's is tough to be, it's tough to be ahead of your time. It is, you know, our patients appreciate when we make a strong case, you know, our, you know, the people who are following the medical literature, they appreciate it. But, you know, the public at large, like I, you know, just I was called an anti-science hate monger, you know, Brian, this week. You know, I had a cardiologist. I had a cardiologist. <laughs> oh, man, you wouldn't believe it. A uh, patient of mine, LDL, was cut to a third. And, you know, I'm talking with him and I'm like, hey, I just want to let you know, you know, uh, you know who I am. You know what I do. We cut, you know, the mutual patient we have, the LDL is cut to a third of what it was. Do you still think we need a statin? And he's like... They must have came off your diet and went vegan, right? Because that's a healthy diet. That's what he said. I was like, actually, no, they didn't, you know? I was like, if you want, I have it published, the data, kind of what, what we think is going on here, and I can send that to you. And uh, But that's this is the world we're up against, you know? And I'm, I guess I'm, I bring it on myself. You know, I'm not – my wife always says you could probably be more like Brian, you know? But, um, you know, I, yeah, but I, I've, I've been probably, banned more than you, Tro. Yeah. I think I'm are, fairly reasonable. Yeah. That darn McCullough got me. I, I, we'll probably get this one blocked just for saying his name. But, you know, certain people you talk to and they're polarizing and they, but, you know, it's one of those things. If you have the data and you have clinical, it, it, it's a, it is really an interesting time in medicine. I'll tell you, you know, I, I, honestly, I'll tell you, I feared, I feared more than a virus or any other stuff. I fear like uh, political stuff more than anything, really. Like when you look at, like, like you say the wrong thing and you get canceled really quickly. You know, or you, you know, you're trying to help people and do the right thing. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you may be wrong. I mean, there's in the history of medicine, there's been a lot of people who've been wrong. There's one thing about being incorrect and one thing about being fraudulent. They're totally different things or being harmful of hurting people. And you go, oh, look, I don't think, you know, if you eat a uh, banana twice a week, will you die of banana poisoning? I don't think so. Right. But what else if someday it turns out that these shakes are causing all kinds of other problems, you know, like pesticides or gut microbiome. There's so much we don't know. And that's what I love about it is like, you know, talking to experts in all different areas, say, how does my area affect your area? You know, like the effects of alcohol or, or whatever, you know, it's really an interesting thing to say, okay, we know alcohol is a poison, but if you have a glass of wine every once in a while, is that going to kill you? Probably not. You know, the, the, the doses, the poisons in the dose too. So anyways, I think, I think what I, what I'm saying, Tro is, Look, we've had so many great guests that we learn stuff from. Like I picked something from Jason Fung. I like this, or I like this from Rob Sivis, or I like this from this person. And and we kind of say, okay, they may not be right on everything, but they're right on enough stuff that they're helping people. Yeah, I mean, look, I think exactly what you're saying. What I, you know, Brian, I really asked myself early on in this pandemic, right? Early on when everybody was scared, you know, uh, at, this is right when I had my surgery, 
you know, when I went out to the testing site, you know, in literally full, you know, gowns and couldn't even use my right arm, but I was, you know, at a testing site, kind of learning what they're doing, helping people. And uh, when I went back to the hospitals and everybody was in spacesuits, basically, because they didn't know what was going on, they were bleaching their, you know, uh, groceries and whatnot, letting it sit for days, you know, throwing their kids in basements and and isolating from them for weeks. And, you know, when all this was going on, I wondered, you know, why there was such a difference between so many people who I really respected before, you know, all these, well, I still respect them, but like, how are all these smart people thinking and acting differently? There's some really smart doctors out there who had wildly different opinions than me. You know, you and I, I think we have this slant where we, where we cherish kind of informed consent and, and autonomy and medical shared decision-making, we have these values. And it struck me like, why would anybody, you know, be so quick to get rid of these values? Like, shouldn't we be championing these? Isn't this a pillar of medicine? And it struck me that I think these people, it's not that they're not smart. It's not that they don't review the data. They, they have a different value set. And that's the reason why we just don't, won't ever get along, you know, I, you know, or, yeah. or not, we won't get along, but we won't see eye to eye their value set. And I'm not saying it's wrong or right. It's just different. Their value well, set. Well, I is- think you, I think, Tro, I think what you're getting at is the, you know, some people look at the greater good and some of you are going to have to sacrifice for the greater good and exactly. you're going to have to have a bad outcome for the greater good. But yeah. then those same people who sacrifice and, and then had a bad outcome, they, they, they were hurting the greater good now. So there was a lot of that, that I saw too, you know, or. Well, that, someone, that's the, know. that's the thing. So like, like, just to finish the thought there, Brian, it's, you know, those other people, those value sets, like I was asking myself, I was trying to introspect Brian and say, you know, these are smart people. How do I have such a fundamentally different view than them? Right. And we're probably, we probably had, you were probably much quicker to re- that realization than I was. And it struck me that, you know, the people who do the real central planning, the regulators, you know, the people who are under pressure in terms of political, you know, population-based medicine, politics, managing massive institutions, you know, they don't care about individuals. They care about an institution, a country, a people, you know, they're like, yeah, of course, everybody, you know, everybody has to do this, right? Because they're not, they're not thinking about individual needs. They're not thinking about what the individual person in front of you may or may not need, right? And if you look at them like in their own lives, right? All these big politicians, the Surgeon General, the, you know, the, all these people, they weren't wearing masks at the ballrooms and the conferences and the galas, right? They weren't doing that, right? So they didn't really care about the individual. They care about a population, an organization, a, a and, but us as doctors, right? That's all we care about. I don't look at my practice and say, ah, I want everybody to be kind of okay. I look at it at every single person I see. I want to I want to do my best for them. And and so yeah, I think- that's 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 it, Tro. You're looking at the individual in front of you, you go, what's best for you? What is best for you? Not your cousin down the street or your neighbor. Right now, my my responsibility to my patient. So that's why when someone says between me and my patient and what I think is best for my patient and based on my research, right? And, and and that this is how I feel. Uh, autonomy. If if there's a drug I give you, throw that. It's a different value set, though. Like it's not like they. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I just don't have that value set. You know, I don't have like people in China. They were completely locked down. They were spraying people everywhere. They were doing you know probes and you know on you know, you know people in New Zealand had a similar thing. They kind of Australia. They locked everything down. I don't have that value set. I cannot, you know, it would have to be re- much more lethal than it was for me to say that these measures would be acceptable. Like, well, I think that's I where we, be, you know, the, but we there's almost no declaration, world. those kind of things where you say, look, let's lock down the, the, the sickest and the, the worst off. And then, you know, if it's going to run the course in 22 year olds that are healthy and you look, go, look, if you have risk factors, protect yourself, do what you have to do. And I think that's, you know, it's a hard thing in retrospect, obviously at the beginning, we all were fearful and we all thought it was going to be crazy. But part of it is when you, when you're fearful, you make crazy decisions, right? If I'm in a building that's burning, if there's someone who, who burned 
you know, I had a little burn down in the kitchen and the fire alarm goes off. I don't jump out of the 23rd story building. But when the fire is burning into my building and my floor and I can't get out, that might be when I say, okay, I'm gonna have to make that decision. And I'm gonna die. And I, so it's one of those things where people were so panicked that they couldn't think and go, okay, let me sit here and look at the reality of the numbers for me personally with my metabolic health and my risk factors. And so what we did is we did a blanket statement for everyone. And I had the fear that I saw in young people that were totally metabolically healthy, the fear it's like, look, let's go through the odds with you, right? Here's your odds of dying in a car accident. Do we not drive anymore? Do you, do I say no one can ever bungee jump because a couple of people died bungee jumping? It's like, you have the right to do it as long as you understand the risks and the benefits. And that's our job is to say, hey, look, your LDL is high. You don't want to be on a statin. Here's the recommendation. Here's the standard of care. Here's what it is. And we, we inform our patients and then they could still make a decision. Or, for instance, a colonoscopy. I don't fire people if they don't get a colonoscopy, but I say, hey, look, here's why we recommend it. Here's why. Here's what the risk and benefits are, or mammograms or whatever whatever screening you wanna talk about. But I don't force it on my patients. I say, look, here's, I strongly recommend it. And I'm even gonna write in my note that I'm telling you to do this right now, because it's that serious. And then yeah. they can make a decision. I don't force them and go, okay, that's it. You know, but. We saw so many crazy things, abandonment of patients. We're not seeing you, you know, you have a knee injury because you didn't have certain things done. And, and it, it just, that's outside the scope of medicine. I mean, that's outside of our ethics and our morality. You know, there's certain things you go, gosh, darn it. We can't, you know, I can't say, well, because you're not low carb, I'm not going to see you anymore. But I'll say, look, here's what's coming. I could throw drugs at you, but why pay me when you, I could just go to any doctor and give you a bunch of drugs. Do you want to get healthier or do you want to get your numbers a little bit better? Which one do you want? You know, so I think it's all those kind of things, but you and I are very, you know, we don't, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff we don't agree on, right. As far as approaches to treatments, things like that, maybe. But I think when you look at like our, how, how we see it, like we see a lot of stuff the same exact way and say, look, here's how we have to intervene. We may have different ways of making that happen, but you know, that's the one thing I, I think it's good when we have, and, and, and this is another thing is that when we have a different point of view, it's good to talk about and go, Tro, why do you see it that way? Brian, why do you see that? Because we've had discussions, you know, and, and you say, oh, I see where you're coming from. I totally get it. That's that's a valid argument, you know, and I'd say you're totally wrong and only my religion's right. It, 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 we've just gotten so polarized in that well, that yeah, we can't have a discussion like this. You know, when you say polarized, so it took me a long time to understand, like even smart people, there's a cardiologist by the name of Eric Topol who's blocked me, you know, early on. I was like, wow, this guy sounds really great. He said, you know, we really have to call for skepticism when it comes to the vaccines. We don't want to rush it. We want people to have faith in it. And then the administration changes. And now, you know, they did the new updated vaccines in eight rodents. And he said, I'm so happy that we have this new vaccine ready to go. And it took me a long time. Like, why? You know, I think it's really hard because we all have these biased you know, underpinnings, whether it's a political belief or a different value set. And I think that they can sometimes really change how we approach medicine. You and know? I think we've conflated things to such a degree where like this new, this new one, it, it flies through the FDA. No one says, Hey, you know, we haven't really studied this in humans. We had eight mice that we studied on. It doesn't someone say, Hey, uh, like if someone asked me, is it safe? I'll say, how yeah, do I know? The one person at the meeting who's, who, who said no, you know, there was one person at the yeah, meeting. Yeah, one person. And you're you know, like, there's a voice there, you know? How doesn't people say, well, how many, you know, first of all, you go, okay, well, when we call it emergency use, how many kids are dying right now of COVID, first of all? Second of all, what's the risk of the vaccine, right? And what do we know in humans? Nothing? Okay, um, let's, guys, should we look at this first and like try it out on some people and, and do informed consent? I mean, that's the problem is because, how do I give you informed consent when it's never been used in a human? I just can't. I could tell you if you have mice you want to take in, here's the data on the mice, but it's hard to extrapolate that to humans because we're different, right? Just like a lot of the animal studies with diet is totally different outcomes than what we see in real humans who are going through divorces and stress in life. Look, I think, you know, it just, it just took me a long time to understand. And if you look, you know, I didn't realize how much, um, how much of these value set differences permeate into medicine. And then it hit me, Brian, that you and I, we have the same thing. We value these certain things. I don't value the collective. I don't really care about the collective. I care about the people in front of me. And that's a value set that I have. Some people are very much like, hey, Troy, you need decorum. You need ways that we, you know, we all, you know, bow and shake hands and say hi and bye. And, you know, we have these mannerisms that we have in society. We need traffic lights. Everybody's got to do the traffic lights. You know, there's a lot of people who really focus on that, but that's not my focus. 
Those are my values and those values permeate into how I practice. And that makes me biased in my own way. But like, yeah. it doesn't, that doesn't make the other person wrong and it doesn't make the other person, I happen to think their approach to medicine has been awful, you know, uh, in this past two years, three years, you know, uh, you know, when you see, uh, you know, when you see these weight loss doctors selling $99 plans that give you an automatic Ozempic prescription, you know, you really say like, okay, when that study comes out in JAMA Internal Medicine saying, hold on, be cautious of these reports that we're seeing, really makes you think where the, how that person's going to change and what they're going to do differently, you know, but. Um, or do you ignore the data and just say, hey, I'm making 99 bucks per person. Here's what you I do, right? I suspect what they'll do is ignore that data because, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're kind of stuck in their ways and it's easier to just not think about it and evaluate their values and evaluate their approach and think about things differently. They probably just say, these are things that, you know, I need to consider this, but I'm not going to change, you know? And um, yeah, and I think those are all valid. I mean, that I think that's why we get along. You try to, you know, look at it. You may be more of a hothead than me and I may say stuff I shouldn't say sometimes and talk too fast and all that. But I think ultimately, I know you care about your patients. You want to do the right thing. You know, you want to make a living. You want to go home to your wife and kids and have, have a good night, you know, and do the right thing and put your head down on the pillow and go to sleep and know you did the right thing as far as you knew it. And we may be wrong on some things, but at least over time you say, okay, if I'm wrong, I have zero, I have zero problem saying, yeah, I told people for all those years, never skip breakfast or you're going to go into like starvation mode and, you know, eat six meals a day because that's what we were told. And then when you saw it not working over and over and over again, you say, okay, let's try something different. Uh oh, that's working better. Okay. I was wrong. Let's go with this new thing. Right. And we may change course again and say, okay, everyone has to be on a high protein, low fat diet. Okay. Maybe at the beginning of moderate fat, maybe it's individual for each person. And I think that's what we're going to ultimately conclude is you can't, it's not a one size fits all, no matter what. I've never seen anything that works perfectly. Otherwise we wouldn't have 10 drugs for the same problem. If we had one blood pressure medicine that worked for everyone and it was perfect, then we just have one and no one would use any of the other ones. Right. So there's a lot of the nuance in the end, but I'm telling you, the problem is if a doctor has seven minutes with you to discuss, you're going through a divorce and you're stressed and you have heartburn, your headaches and knee pain, uh, they're not going to be talking about lifestyle and diet and, and, and sleep and all these other things that are critical. So we miss a lot of the equation when we, it, it time is the, you know, time is the most valuable thing you have, right? Some of you wasted an hour listening to me and Trover and on, but you know, time is important. Like I hate to waste my time. I could waste money on stuff and I don't feel as bad as wasting time because that's time I have away from my family and kids and, you know, doing fun stuff I want to do. And so, you know, I think it's, you know, the doctor, when they only have three minutes with you or five minutes, and then they're just looking to the next patient trying to get past you. And they really don't care about the outcomes. Really, honestly, some people don't because they're just saying, look, I got to see my 35 patients a day. Why do I say that? Because I was in that model for a long time. And that's why I couldn't handle it. It's like, if I can't help my patients to the best of my ability, I'm out. I'll do something else. I'll go, you know, clean cars or do whatever I can do, you know? So I think that's where, you know, coming back to how we started this discussion, Tro, it's like the, the physician burnout because these people came in. They think they're going to save the world and help everyone. And they realize I'm just a cog in the wheel. Like if I die tomorrow, they just pop someone else in my spot. It's not like you've really impacted people to the way that you wanted to. And can I, can I just tell yeah. you about that? You know, I mean, just because I've talked about this and I've posted uh, something and I tagged you on it, you know, because I think we're failing a generation of medical students, you know, we're not inspiring them to change people's lives, to help people. I think we're really indoctrinating them into this model of seven minute visits and, you know, doctor knows best and uh, efficiency. You know, yeah. And the thing is, is, you know, uh, we're, we, you know, finalized, uh, uh, we hired some, we've been, I tell, I've been telling you about this and my concerns about hiring another doctor and seeing if we can grow this, you know, nationwide practice. Um, you know, we hired another doctor, an amazing doctor, board certified in uh, family medicine. She's on the board for the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, Dr. Laura. And, you know, my the way I'm thinking is, how can I put this person, this doctor in the best position so she has the time to care for her patients? So she has the, you know, she's able to express her curiosity or individuality as a doctor. And I really hope, you know, I'm hoping that as time goes on, more and more doctors can see the value in this model and grow, you know, and grow because the reality is, is Amazon's coming, Apple's coming, the hospital systems have already come, venture capital's already come. And, you know, how many people are there like you and me, Brian? I mean, you could probably count on your hands, you know, how many people, you know, in the DPC model. 
Yeah, I'm hoping that because I'm older than you, Tro. So I, I'm hoping people will put me out of business and come in and do the same thing, right? I mean, that's what we need. We we have a when we look at the the devastation that we're seeing now, it is we, we can't afford to lose doctors. We can't afford to lose um, you know people in healthcare that understand that connect with patients. It's too critical. I mean, this is. I mean, there's nothing more important than your health. You can have all the money. I tell people this all the time. You can have all the money in the world, but if you, you go to Cancun and you can't get off your chair and your family's out there having fun playing volleyball in the water and you can't get up, doesn't matter how many millions you have, you, you can't enjoy the moment. And if you're hurting and you're in pain and you're depressed and you're, you know, can't sleep and all these things, or you've screwed over the whole world to make a few bucks. I, I think that's, there's way more to it than just what you're eating. You know, if you're stressed out all the time, you go, this job, like a lot of doctors are looking at it going, it's not worth it. That's what I did. I go, it's not worth it. You know, you know, Troy, you counsel me a lot in that time. And you go, Brian, you got to get out. You're going to kill yourself doing this stuff. And and you're right. I, I, I don't even want to think where I'd be, you know, two more years into that system. I was just so done. And I wasn't a benefit to my patients just because I was too busy. I was working all the time. I tried, but it was inefficient. I couldn't do it. So anyways, I, I think that's, no, okay. uh, you know, I'll get off the soapbox. But... One last, one last thing about that. You know, I think the biggest thing is the fear that patients won't value that, you know, they won't value it. the patient is, won't value that, you know, that how will I make a living, you know, but like you will make it, you know, like uh, if you build it, they will come. Yeah, and yeah. if you do a good job and you treat people right, word of mouth, like we don't have to, I don't advertise uh, this podcast, I guess. But, you know, I think it's, and, and most of the people listening are not in my area, right? They're not even going to see me as a doctor ever. But if we help people, because I know through the reach of this podcast, we've helped way more people than we'll ever even know. I mean, I hear communities right. being changed. I think we're it's at amazing. 6, million, 6 million lives we've reached, 6 million. I think it's somewhere around there. How crazy is that? Yeah, it's insane, right? You know, something like six million downloads, I think, uh, or more, or around there. I don't, I don't remember. And they story. criticize us. They say we weren't going to do anything, and they like no one wanted to hear it. But, you know, I think, I think, you know, you, you when you look back and you go, it, it, we're helping people. Obviously, they're not going to listen to stuff that's wasting their time. So I think we've done a good job of having variety, and hopefully, we get more people on to tell their stories. I think that's really valuable, and you know, it's been fun, Tro. Yeah, thanks for your impact. I mean, I think we've been a good match for each other. We bring us each other up and down and balance us out and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and I love that you'll say, hey, Brian, I don't agree with you on this. And I'll say, Tro, I don't agree with you on this. And we can have a discussion. You know, as a matter of fact, someone came in my office the other day, goes, hey, are you and Tro on the outs? Are you guys getting a lot? No, why do you say that? Well, he's done some without you and you've done some without him. I'm like, no, it's just timing and we're busy. But, you know, I think that when you have a respect and, you know, I know your integrity and you know my integrity and what, what we're here for. And so I think it, it all works out. So everyone, Tro, it's fun we didn't have a guest. We should do this every now and again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is awesome, man. You know, I'm, I I miss it, man. It's been weeks, you know. It's been I know, weeks. we've been too it's busy. Nice to, I know. Nice to connect with you. Again. One of these days we'll have a mid, somewhere in the in the Midwest that we can talk at the oh. same time and hang out. Are you doing it in the middle? Are you going to be in Boca or no? I don't think so. I might take a little break. Got it. Okay. I've been too busy, man. I might take a little breather and hang out with people and stuff. I told Doug I would I would step down for a little while because there's a lot of great speakers coming in. So I'm like, I don't, why waste time with me? You, me and Trevor are probably going to say the say the same things anyway. So bringing some people from down under and you know South Africa and you know get some diversity in there. So I think we, he's doing a good job of changing it up a bit, and I think it's important. No one wants to hear the same people over and over. I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. It's it's going to be a. Uh... It's going to be a nice conference in uh, the Society of Millibar, the Symposium for Metabolic Health in uh, in uh, Boca. It's going to be it's going to be great. There's going to be a huge a hold down food addiction. It's going to be the second World Congress on food addiction. Yeah, that's awesome. It's going to be great. That's good stuff. So All everyone, right. hey, thanks for sticking with us. You know, Tro, thanks for being my guest, and I can be your guest. But uh, any last words of wisdom on the way out? No, that's it. Just, uh, um, you know, it's, it's been, a, it's four years, four years, Brian. Unreal, so, man. How my, how has that flown by? I don't know. Yeah. It's and writing my five year uh, recap, you know, uh, on the practice and where we've been and where we're going. And uh, oh man, oh man, it's been, it's been a journey. Yeah, keep up the work, man. You're taking over the whole country. That's good stuff. But I think you're doing the right stuff, getting getting people in and, you know, say, hey, if you're in Albuquerque, we got someone for you. You know, I think when we, 
as we get more and more doctors who understand it, because it's frustrating for a lot of people. They come to me because they're like, look, my doctor yells at me every time. I go, look at your numbers. Look at your coronary calcium. Look at, let, let's look at the whole big picture. And so it's hard because we, we get so focused on one thing. And, and hopefully over time, you know, the big picture comes into focus and not just looking at one little thing. And, you know, for us, as we've said all along, Tro, it's all cause mortality. We're looking at everything. We ha that's our job is say, what's the most likely thing to be a problem in the next couple of years? And let's try to mitigate the damage if you're smoking too much or drinking too much. And a lot of times, you know better that you don't need us to tell you, you know, what's bad and what's good and what's helping you, what doesn't. And you know, when you're feeling well, you know, keeping journals, doing all that, whatever it works, whatever works for you, ultimately some, you know, I, I've learned a lot that people were, we're all different. We have different motivators and different things that are, are going to work. So it's keep plugging along till you find that thing. So thanks Bye. for listening. Thank Tro. you. Thanks to the Patreon and people who donated. And yeah. thanks for everybody for joining us and dealing with our rants. Ryan, have a good one. You too.